Welcome to this week's episode of Brainstorm, where we give you a glimpse into the world of science for Wednesday, December 19th, 2012. Our top story comes from the world of medicine. John Hopkins researchers have been studying a protein pair related to blood vessels in the nervous system and retina. Specifically, the protein Frizzled 4 and its activator, Norin. The first job this pair has is during embryonic development. You see, the retina actually requires the most oxygen per gram of any tissue in the body. So, it requires three interconnected networks of blood vessels to function properly and supply enough oxygen. Defects in these proteins can cause the blood vessels to not develop properly, causing blindness. And the hope is that boosting frizz may help treat damage to these blood vessels caused by aging and diabetes. The second major function of this protein pair relates to the blood-brain barrier. Normally, the cells that make up the actual walls of blood vessels contain large windows in their membranes and are loosely connected to each other. This allows larger molecules to easily pass from the blood to surrounding tissue. However, in the brain, these passageways are essentially shut down as a means of protecting the brain from pathogens. But without constant signaling from frizz, the brain vasculature begins leaking like regular blood vessels. Now the researchers hope to further study these proteins, as temporarily weakening the blood-brain barrier could allow large drug molecules to enter the brain, as the barrier is a major obstacle in treating neurological conditions. Next is an update from the world of chemistry. Scientists from the City College of New York and Rice University are working together to create a better battery. In particular, a more environmentally friendly lithium-ion battery. These are probably the most common kind of batteries, but there are some issues with them. For example, a common cathode for lithium-ion batteries involves cobalt. This is a finite material that needs to be mined to keep up with the demand for batteries, as 30% of cobalt production goes to batteries. The processing of cobalt with lithium is also expensive and requires high temperatures, and therefore lots of energy. Same goes for recycling these materials, which ironically ends up resulting in a lot of CO2 emissions from the power requirements. Which is why the scientists looked for an alternative material in nature. One of the most promising compounds they found is called purpurin, which despite its name is actually a natural red dye that's been used for thousands of years. Originally discovered by civilizations in Asia and the Middle East, it's created by simply boiling the roots of the matter plant. The molecule itself is what's known as an aromatic ring, which essentially means a certain kind of six-carbon ring with additional molecular groups attached. We won't get too involved in the specific organic chemistry of purpurin, but the side groups make it ideal for electron exchange. Most importantly, processing is simple and results in renewable and even biodegradable electrodes. The purpurin is just dissolved in an alcohol and mixed with a lithium salt at room temperature. Growing the matter plant could even absorb some CO2, although the scientists are investigating other biological compounds and efficient ways to produce them. We end with news from the world of biology. Here on Brainstorm, we've talked about antibiotic resistance before, but we haven't really discussed the mechanisms involved. Bacteria generally develop one of two strategies when pressured to evolve antibiotic resistance, either pumping out the antibiotic compound really quickly or modifying it so it's not harmful. Now, a team of Canadian and French scientists have found a third potential mechanism for antibiotic resistance. Before we get into the mechanism, we should discuss how they found it. Fortunately, this new resistant strain is a non-pathogenic soil bacteria, and it's become resistant to antibiotics used on livestock. And this discovery was made possible by the team's 14-year study of veterinary antibiotics on soil. After experimenting with the same soil for all these years, the team wanted to compare how fresh soil reacted to the antibiotics. The soil that had been repeatedly exposed broke down the antibiotic up to five times faster than the newly exposed soil, meaning antibiotic resistance had been selected for, and this matches trends of pesticide and herbicide breakdown. After the experiments, they cultured the bacteria in the soil to get a closer look. The surprising result was the bacteria actually breaking down the compound, not just to detoxify it, but to consume it as a nutrient. And this is the first recorded instance of a bacteria actually metabolizing an antibiotic as a food source. The bad news is, if the other bacteria are developing this mechanism, it could find its way into pathogenic organisms through lateral gene transfer. 
The good news is, we now know about it and can continue to study. As well, it's actually better for the soil that the antibiotic get broken down quickly. Well, hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please consider subscribing and be sure to check the links in the video description.